Hello, thank you for joining us today for our webinar on how Akron Water built one KPI to rule them all. I'm Billy Emus, I'm a sales associate here at AWWA, and I will be your moderator for today's mm -hmm. webinar. Here are some tips to enhance your webinar experience. We recommend you close email, instant messengers, and any other programs not currently in use as they may interfere with the smooth reception of the webinar causing slide buffering and poor sound quality. Technical assistance can be found at the GoToWebinar technical support page on the slide shown. As soon as you close the GoToWebinar screen to leave the webinar, a window will open with a survey questionnaire. We ask that you all take a few minutes to answer the survey questions. Your feedback is important to us and helps us improve webinar programming. We encourage group participants to pick one person to enter collective responses to the survey and submit them to us. Before we hear from our speakers, I need to inform you that the mention of specific products or services in this webinar does not represent a WWA endorsement. A WWA does not endorse or approve products or services. I'm pleased to introduce our distinguished panel of experts for today's program, Alan Hinchman and Jeff Bernowski. Today's webinar is brought to you by Gray Matter. In the next hour, you will learn how Gray Matter and the City of Akron Water Supply Bureau co-innovate to develop a customized operations hub that weaves together continuously updated SCADA data, utility operator observations, and lab testing data to prove an accurate portrayal of plant operations. Our panel will be happy to answer your questions. Please feel free to submit questions at any time throughout this broadcast by using the question pane at the lower right of your screen. Please include your name and the name of the panelist to whom your question should be directed. Let's begin. Alan Hinchman has over 20 years of experience managing technology deployments in industrial facilities across North America. He's the Chief Revenue Officer at Gray Matter. Alan served as Gray Matter's Chief Innovation Officer a role in which he co-innovated solutions with clients that allowed them to optimize and grow their businesses. Alan previously worked as Chief Operating Officer of the Water Initiative, a team of global business executives and renowned scientists who develop water systems to fit local conditions. Prior to the Water Initiative, Alan was the Global Market Director for Water and Wastewater Industries at GE Digital. In addition, he has considerable experience with energy, oil and gas, and smart building offerings. Jeff Bernowski has served as the manager for the City of Akron Water Supply Bureau since 2013. Previously, Jeff worked as a plant manager, plant engineering manager, and product project manager, project engineer at City of Akron. Jeff holds a bachelor's degree in civil engineering from the University of Akron. Take it away, Alan and Jeff. Thank you so much for that introduction, Billy. That's awesome. So a couple of things. One, I'm super appreciative of everyone joining us today because I get to introduce and talk to uh, a great friend. Uh, we've known each other for about a decade now. And what's always impressed upon me is that Akron is, is a city that a lot of folks don't know a lot about. And I'm going to ask a couple of questions on that to Jeff. But moreover, it's a city that is 100% into creating new ideas, becoming a think tank in the water industry, and in many cases has installed technologies that have just um, been well above what I would say in their weight class. So always punching above their weight class, and we're appreciative to have the opportunity to work with City of Akron. Um, maybe before we kick off, though, Jeff, one of the questions I was going to ask is if you could just tell us a little bit more about what your role is at the city of Akron. Yeah, thank you, Alan, and thanks to all that are participating in this uh, webinar. I greatly appreciate uh, me getting the opportunity to tell Akron's story. Um, so thank you so much. Um, I am the uh, Akron Water Supply Bureau Manager. So ultimately what that means is I'm responsible for the operations of our drinking water supply system, which would in, it's including an entire watershed where we own 20,000 acres of property. We have a water plant that is pumping about 31 million gallons per day right now. And when I say that number, it just makes me cringe because it goes down year after year after year, most especially this year with the COVID crisis and the pandemic, we're down over 7% in our pumpage at, at the utility. So with the reducing in pumpage is the reducing in revenue, which just greatly affects everything we do. But uh, yeah, we're a uh, 
surface water utility. Um, we have a infrastructure that's over a hundred years old. Our plant was put into service in 1915. We have water mains that date even prior to that back into the 1800s. Um, so, you know, we have one heck of a challenge in front of us, but uh, I lead a great group of people um, here at, at Akron, and I'm so proud to just have the opportunity to talk about it today. So thank you. Yeah, you're absolutely blessed with probably one of the, the nicest uh, water plants in the country. Um, it does. It dates back over 100 years. It's actually a brick. If you ever have a chance to go, I know Jeff and the team will be happy to walk you around. They're very proud of a very beautiful facility that they they just keep immaculate and uh, I would say it's rock uh, Rockellian of uh, or Rockwellian of uh, water plants it's just a, a beautiful kind of turn of the century kind of place and and one that um, if you have a chance go visit the dichotomy of that is that you're while you're built inside of a lot of tradition and a city that is in the renewal phase one of the things that you've done Jeff amazingly well is you've brought this guiding philosophy using technologies. Can you kind of give us an idea like specifically how does that apply to operational data and you're in in some cases you kind of tie the three you've got a guiding technology, uh, a, a thirst for data and then you use that to improve your efficiency in operations. Can you kind of walk us through uh, how that all works and how you've built that out? Yeah as, as I think about like Akron's water philosophy associated with technology. I mean, it's not as if we have some type of motto or some type of, you know, vision statement associated with it. But ultimately, as I think about the question, it's essentially we've utilized the experiences of the past, and in some cases they haven't been good experiences, to identify the technological tools that can help us improve the future. All right. And a lot of these experiences, some of them, you know, quite dramatic, um, has has forced us to find solutions that can solve these problems. Um, right now, uh, EPA regulations, you have to start with that. Um, you know, the, the stage two disinfection byproducts rule now that are a number of years old, uh, we really, really struggled going um, from the, you know, going to the locational running annual average. And so it forced us to figure out ways to solve those problems. Lead and copper, like many water utilities, has become of the utmost importance um, for the, you know, the the safety of our customers, for you know, just the um, you know, the public awareness and the public acceptance of our water system to make absolutely sure that our lead and copper results are as good as they possibly could be. And here in Ohio, you know, we've been under a lot of pressure with regards to algal toxins. Um, city of Toledo, who's not too far from us um, here, uh, they had their water system shut down for an entire weekend, which then, you know, a couple of years later resulted in some very stringent regulations associated with algal toxins to where Ohio, Ohio EPA said, if these certain conditions exist in your drinking water supply, we will issue do not drink advisories. So more pressure on staff to say this cannot happen to us um you know the increase in operational costs and labor costs uh, chemical costs um, the reduced water consumption that i talked about earlier and one of the biggest things and and i don't know you know across the country i'd be real curious to see if other utilities are dealing with this but cities like akron who have combined sewers okay are now subjected to very extensive improvement um, projects, in our case, a consent decree, where our customer base, now this is our sewer customers, but water and sewer, you know, it's all on the same bill and it's all coming from the same pocket. Um, they are subjected to a billion dollar consent decree right now, which resulted in sewer rates tripling just since 2015. Now, water has not had water rate increases since 2012. So what that program has done, what that combined sewer consent decree program has done that we're under has forced water to find ways to optimize their process. We have to find ways other than going to the well, which would be simply in a lot of utilities to say, we need to raise rates. And we just didn't have and haven't had that opportunity since 2012 
So we've had to find ways internally. We had to look in the mirror and say, where are there opportunities to save money? Where are our inefficiencies? Um, and what are the tools that we can use, either existing tools that we have or new tools that we can purchase that could help find additional savings in our operations? And so that's, that's generally been the philosophy we've been abiding by over the last, say, five years right now in um, trying to take full advantage of the technology we have, plus looking to new technologies in the future. Well, what you, what you described is really kind of the triangle that a lot of folks in the water industry deal with, which is people, process, and technology. And the thing that, that, that I'm really intrigued about is what type of leadership support have you gotten to continue to drive into the technology when you've got um, process issues that you mentioned, when you've got um, some technology pieces, like how do you pull all that together and what's been the leadership's reaction to that? And, and then how did you build on that? I cannot emphasize enough how much support I've received from our city administration, Mayor Dan Horrigan, our service director, Chris Luttle, with regards to leadership support um, for technology-driven solutions. A prime example of that is that we here in water uh, worked with our economic development and created an organization called the Akron Global Water Alliance. And it's a 5013C organization, nonprofit, profit, which was built specifically to find innovative, um, innovative solutions to solve water treatment issues. It was built to educate our staff and educate our colleagues throughout the industry. And it was an economic development tool for the city of Akron. Okay. Essentially what it was, was we were trying, we are trying to court um, new businesses, new companies, new technologies to the city of Akron with the intention, if you could prove that your technology works here in Akron, we could be your testing ground, we can be your resume, we could be someone, your reference that could reference another utility. As part of that arrangement, they are expected to establish their, their business headquarters or an office here in the city of Akron. So I, I mentioned that because what it did was it gave us a look into so many different technologies that exist in the water industry that are just looking for an opportunity. There are so many great ideas. There's so many people that are trying to work in a garage. There's so many different things overseas, internationally, that just cannot get a shot in the United States or cannot get a shot with the utility because we are a very conservative. We want to prove it to us, prove it to us. Where have you done this before? And so we created that organization with the, you know, the, the opportunity of helping Akron as a water utility, as well as these smaller technologies. So um, that's where it starts. Other leadership um, support is from my staff. My staff, including, you know, the chief utility operators, the superintendents, the foremen, the supervisors, all of them are on board and have a vision to, to really look towards the future. And, and sometimes it's different for the sake of being different, doing something different just because we've always done it that way. Let's try something new. And so, you know, it takes certain people, certain special people with a lot of initiative in order to go down that road. And we do it. Um, we also have gotten a tremendous amount of support from the administration with regards to investment in our infrastructure and software. All right, we're, we're gonna talk extensively about our SCADA program and iFix today, but in order for a SCADA system to work, in order for iFix to work, you have to have the infrastructure in place to feed all of this data back into the system. So we're talking flow meters and level transmitters and sensors and leak detection and all different types of analyzers, chlorine and pH and fluoride and turbidity, and the list goes on and on and on. Um, as, as we look at our system and where it exists now, we have over 3,500 tags in our SCADA system. And each and every one of those tags represents some type of chemical parameter, a specific output from a sensor or an analyzer, or some type of calculation that's being done with a combination of sensors and analyzers. So um, in order to be successful, you really need the support of leadership to invest 
in all of those types of items to make it happen. So, Man, I'm really excited that you brought up the Alliance. That's how we met was our participation in the Alliance when I was at the General Electric Company. And what we really did, I think, I think moreover than some of the things that you said, is it changed the way you thought about innovation. Um, I, I can remember, and I would say this, and, I, and I'd love to have your opinion, is prior to the alliance, Akron had one mentality of what innovation was, and after the alliance, I know you changed your thought pattern right before my eyes many times um, after that. And so was, was that a moment where you said, look, there is an opportunity here to really drive new technology, and it became a rallying call around the utility? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, we've always believed to be cutting edge with regards to some of the things we do, but that really brought us down this bleeding edge of, of opportunity that exists out there. And it comes with a lot of risks. I mean, we, we had a number of failures along the way, but we had a number of successes like the one we're talking about today with the GEI fix. Um, but yeah, it, um, it, and it really opens your eyes to, you know, we, we, we hosted a conference every year for over five years here in Akron, which brought all these small, smaller technology providers, brought all of our colleagues that, you know, from other water utilities that do what we do every day. And um, it really opened your eyes to like it, how, how things are done differently across the world. We have relationships with the Netherlands, the Netherlands Water Alliance, with Israel, um, and how in a lot of cases internationally, they're even further advanced than we are, which we always think, you know, the United States is cutting edge with a lot of things, and we are in a lot of cases, but on the water side, um, there are definitely things to learn outside, you know, our borders. So. I'm gonna put you on the spot here. Uh, I'm gonna bring back one of my memories from the Alliance um, in a number of years ago, because I think it really illustrates what you're saying. So. If you could just give us a little bit of information around when you built the limbs screens for the lab in iFix, where you took a SCADA system and built some screens to avoid a whole bunch of cost, but also to tighter integrate data, kind of real-time data to lab data. And, and to me, that was one, of, it's still today, one of the few things you see around um, the water industry, but just that that connection uh, was very very innovative and still is today i'd love to get some updates on that yeah so um about five years we upgraded our SCADA system to the ifix prophecy and one thing that that we got from that was the ability to customize that we previously didn't have and the ability to integrate with other software platforms okay so um that was exciting to us because that opened up a whole bunch of different doors that we really never ever considered and um so historically the way we handled data was primarily with excel spreadsheets okay um we we've never owned the limb system um we used to document all of our data in excel spreadsheets um, we used to document a lot of our data on clipboards. We used to document a lot of our data, even as simple on paper notes and those types of things. And um, in many cases, we're doing a tremendous amount of double data entry. Um, and when, when you're dealing with multiple spreadsheets and clipboards and a lot of paper, all right, when you look at like record retention rules, and when you look at trying to compare that data or go back to that data or history on that data, it is so difficult. I mean, I can show you boxes and boxes of, of paper that we have stored right now. Um, that was the old notes from operators or laboratory analysts and such that, um, you know, when someone said, well, can we go back and look what happened, you know, two years ago, three years ago, it was just so difficult. So we, as, as we thought about it, as, as we worked with Gray Matter, we said, is there a way to do this differently? And one of the things we came up with was we could put data entry in the actual SCADA system itself. Okay, so, um, and, and actually I could, if I could go to a screen share here real quick, I, I'd like to quickly share what I'm talking about. 
Okay. Let me show my screen on this. And Alan, if you can give me the thumbs up when you're seeing you're this. You're good, my friend. You're good. Okay, fantastic. So so what you're looking at here on the screen is just the, the first introductory screen into our GEI Fix program. And you can see a lot of buttons on the screen. And, and I'm not going to talk much about, I mean, all the different things. I mean, there's amazing things that go on. But one of the tabs that you see here is lab data, okay? And when I click on this lab data, and for example, I click on um, our basin daily uh, lab data screen, okay? So now all of our data associated with the lab is required to be put into the SCADA system, okay? We no longer have someone write it on a clipboard and then all of a sudden go into an Excel spreadsheet. And then that Excel spreadsheet needs to be accessed by multiple people and so on and so forth. It is all right here on this. In this case, it's our, our sedimentation basin data, but it's all right here. And the things that you do with it is everything is time stamped. Okay, the date and the time in which the data was entered is time stamped. Everything is audited. So, for example, if someone fat fingers a piece of data, instead of a, a pH of 6.71, if they put a pH of 67.1, all right, which would happen routinely in Excel spreadsheets, because, um, you know, our lab is responsible for so many different data points each and every day, um, you know, that, that could get missed, okay? When you fat finger something here, it says, are you sure? This is out of the range. It doesn't make sense. Um, you could, you know, so you have the ability to do that. If for some reason you go back and you need to tra uh, change the data, you can do that. You can mark it as, as a bad, the original uh, piece of data was bad. You can make a note and you can replace the data. And there's an entire audit trail. All this data is going into a historian. So this data that you see here, the lab data, is now in the same historian. And the historian is essentially the server where all pieces of information is stored re with regard to the entire system. And so now, all of a sudden, we can use the SCADA system and the trending modules to, to go in and say, I want to compare a piece of lab data to an analyzer or a sensor out in the field. It, historically, that was not possible. Historically, it was, it, I shouldn't say it wasn't possible, but it was very, very time consuming where you're drawing data out of SCADA into an Excel format. You then, you know, take maybe a, a, a clipboard data or some other Excel and you put it together and you try to compare. And so it, it was very cumbersome. So by doing this, it just uh, created a host of different opportunity. Some of the other things that bring a lot of value to this is now there's alarms and there's, uh, there's, um, there's communication when this data comes in and it's, and it, for some reason, a range that could be critical. This is an emergency. The turbidities are too high um, or some other parameter. The chlorines are too low. The chlorines are too high. Um, we have it set up to where um, when that data goes in, you have instant text messages, you have instant emails to supervisors to state that there is an issue with regards to whatever parameter that may have been put in. And so all of the notification process that exists in a lot of SCADA systems, like that's not something that's all that exciting. But when you have the lab data now in there and you can put multiple parameters together, you could say if the lab data is this and the SCADA data is this, I want to send out an alarm and notify supervision um, that, or notify an operator that there may be an issue. So. That's the kind of opportunity that, that we've been able to uh, have in this. Um, you know, we, we have, you know, you could see our, our tap data, and this just gives you an idea of all the different parameters that are being documented by our uh, laboratory staff on a daily basis, turbidity, alkalinity, hardness, chlorine dioxide, chlorine, chlorides. Um, all of that is right here, and it's in a format that, um, that is available and quickly available um, to staff um, for accessibility. One other thing um, I'd like to mention while I'm here on this screen is um, historically we had an operations log. And I, I imagine a lot of utilities have operations log, which on a shift, you know, someone will document this happened at this time. 
We also integrated the operations log into SCADA as well. So this button here on the top where you read ops log, okay, and this is what we're looking at right now. Um, this has, you know, the, the name of the operator. This is Nathan Brown. Nathan Brown at 12, uh, at 113 um, had the Alm driver leaving the facility. Um, we have him here. We received the caustic delivery at 1238. Another, so all the, you know, there's a lot of information there, but all the notes. And what's nice about this is that we can then search this. So we can, historically, it was on a piece of paper. It was on a, you know, it may have been on a Word document that was saved on some file that, you know, now all of a sudden we can go, what happened on December 14th? What was it that caused maybe a turbidity event or a chlorine event or whatever the case may be? We can quickly go in and we can um, run just any type of search function and uh, be able to access that information. Um, we're able to then, operators will print this out. They'll share it with the next shift. There's, as part of the, the printout, we can get a lot of different um, parameters associated with this. So we could say, hey, print out the notes for today, put the pump rates, put the dosages that we're feeding for all the different chemicals, um, create a snapshot of the day. And it's very simple. It's very easy. It doesn't require the operators to go in and, um, you know, go in and find numbers and put them in. The, you know, it just, it, it's a very simple, easy process that is very, uh, saves a lot of time and is very efficient. So one of the things um, that I want to do is, is kind of zoom out for a second though. And so what are some of the operational metrics or tools that you've got in this? While we've still got the screens up, I think you can probably talk about what are some of the operation tools that you use maybe regularly? Yeah. So what, um, what we we've done, um, and I'll I'll go to some other areas of the plan here. All right. So what what we've done is we have certain programs that are in place um, for different tasks. So for example, chemical inventory. All right. What what you're looking at here is a snapshot of our um, a, a snapshot of our, our one of our major chemical uh, facilities that we have here on the plant. And you can see each and every one of these identifies the amount, the volumes that are available for each of these different chemicals, caustic, fluoride, chloride, hypochlorite, zinc, um, hydrochloric acid. Um, and so what we've been able to do is Historically, an operator would come in and write down, we have, you know, 5,722 gallons of fluoride right now. Now, what we've done, instead of having an operator go in there and have to write this information down, put it in a spreadsheet, we've created these integrations with other programs, in the case of our chemical inventory, a chemical inventory program, which now takes this information and puts out order alerts. It tells the supervisor, hey, we're, we're, um, we're currently at this volume, all right? We currently at this demand because the SCADA system knows exactly what the demand is of these chemicals at any one time, all right? We need to place an order and we need this delivery to arrive on this day, all right? And that will keep us within um, an acceptable level of chemicals so we continue to have appropriate storage. So we have operate, um, opportunities like that. We have opportunities with regards to like raw water reservoirs where um, we're taking the uh, levels of, we have 10 billion gallons of, of water storage, raw water storage um, up in our watershed. And so we, we have the opportunity to release that water when we want to and um, you know, utilize the, the releases as ways to improve water quality in these reservoirs. And so, we have a reservoir release program where there's literally integrations with that program that make recommendations to the staff. Um, and then finally, and one of the ones we're, we're, we're most excited for is we're working with an outside vendor right now, Fontis Blue, and they have a Decision Blue product where it is taking the, the, uh, the, the treatment results in the lab data um, from from these data input screens, putting it into their program and giving us recommendations for treatment, okay, to where we, we've seen just in the last year almost a, 
uh, 20% savings in chemical costs with regards to this treatment optimization process that we're going through, which um, is really exciting. It's, it's looking at ultimately target, uh, target results with regards to disinfection byproducts, uh, with, results, with results um, with respect to uh, chemical, uh, um, chemical residual, or uh, I'm sorry, chlorine residuals. So there's just um, so much opportunity that we've found with all these integrations into other programs that um, we're just super excited about it and can see a whole bunch more opportunities coming in the future to improve water quality, which is most important, and to, uh, you know, obviously do it in the most affordable way we possibly can. So. I think a lot of folks that are watching you speak um, are impressed with some of the results, but one of the questions they may have, you have a very peculiar thing in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, for a water plant, I've never seen hours until empty. So can you walk uh, folks through uh, what that is? And, and by the way, yeah. it's gone up. You were 11 and a half hours, now you're 11.6 hours since we've been yeah. speaking. Yeah, Ex Seven. exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, so what's what's going on here is with this hours till empty is that, um, you know, typically and the reason why it's going up is because our our, our normal de demand right now, like I mentioned, is 30 million gallons a day. Well, right now we're doing about 38, almost 39 million gallons a day. We're pumping into the system. So what we're doing is we're increasing the volume of our reservoirs out in distribution, okay? So as you increase the volume in your reservoirs out in distribution, all right, you have more hours until you're actually empty, okay? Hours till empty is kind of like the distance till empty that you have in your car. How many miles can I go before I run out of gas, okay? This is how much time do I have before the first customer in our distribution system identifies less than 20 PSI pressure. Um, and Alan, I'm getting a terrible feedback and I'm not sure if that's on your end or what, but um, anyways, the, so the hours until empty represents if the plant would stop pumping as we speak right now, we have a little over 11 and a half hours um, to, to react, okay? that's not much time all right there you know there are a host of different things that can uh you know that can cause that 11 and a half hours to to you know or a host of different failures that could happen that we need to go to that number so um from an emergency planning standpoint um it's 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 so important so when if the power will say goes out and i'm here at the plant right now as we speak if the power goes out that's the first number everybody starts asking about. How much time do we have? Do we have enough time to call people in? Do we have to notify our customers? Is it a problem that's big enough that um, is going to cause a possible depressurization because we don't have the time to fix it? Um, so it's, it's really exciting. But in order to come up with that tag, all right, there are a lot of things going on. All right, we, we literally need to know what those elevations are, what the volumes are in these tanks out in our distribution system. We need to know the demand, okay? So a day like today um, has less demand than a day like in the heart of the summer where residents and customers may be watering. Um, you know, if let's say it's, it's uh, three in the morning and the power goes out, all right, that's gonna be a little higher number all right, because the demand at three in the morning isn't like the demand at seven in the morning. So that's taken into account there. And then also we had to do a tremendous integration with our GIS system. So, um, you know, we, I, I'm so blessed here at Akron to have a GIS staff that just does some amazing things, but we were able to geolocate every one of our customers and they were able to tell me the elevation of, of at the elevation of the ground level of every service. So I have 85,000 services out in the distribution system. They gave me an elevation and they said, here is your highest elevation in the normal service district. So normal is those that are fed from the water plant. Then we have high, 
who essentially those are where you see your water towers and your tanks and your standpipes. Um, those actually have pump stations that draw out of normal and push into high. All right. They're always okay because they're drawing out of normal. All right. They'll eventually, you know, run out of water as well. But it's, it's the highest customer in the normal area that is the one that's going to, um, you know, be under the, you know, uh, be, be when that 11.6 hours till empty hits. So it, it took a lot of, of work to come up with that calculation, to come up with the da- demand, to, to come up with the elevations. Um, but it is so important um, from a emergency standpoint that it really, you know, either gives you comfort at 11.6. Uh, I'm not very comfortable. That's why it's yellow. When it gets up over 12 in our world, that's about the best you're going to get with the storage capacity we have. Um, you know, 12 to 14 is is like when the tanks are, are full. And there's times when it will get less than six. Um, because we're trying to get turnover in these tanks for the purposes of, you know, tank turnover and and better water quality data. So that's what that's about, and it's a pretty cool tag, quite frankly. I'm so the the folks that set that up for us, it's just fantastic. And there was a tremendous amount of civil engineering that went into that, but also it's a combination of operators, lab folks, um, you know, your engineering team. How do you build support among such a diverse crowd of of people in the utility? Um, it, it, at first, it was not easy. At first, and in, in, in I, I had at least one operator, more one that was willing to come up to me and say, what is my job? You are eliminating a lot of things that I do um, with all these new programs and these new sensors and these new, um, you know, flow meter, all these things that operators used to do uh, is, you know, no longer part of their, their job. And it it really took some time to really impress upon the staff that the intention here is not to replace you. The intention is to to make ourselves smarter. The intention here is to um, advance from a technology standpoint to where your job is no longer to be a fireman and have to react to all these emergencies, your job is to be proactive. Your job is to help develop these programs so we can provide higher water quality at a lower cost. Um, I I really describe it as more turning operations from an art. We, We used to have a lot of artists in how we ran the plant and it was based on a lot of feel and it was based on a lot of personal experience as to um, why the way in which people reacted to certain situations. And now it's clearly a science. It's now it's, it's data driven, it's machine learning. Um, But in order to create this science and in order to create these routines and these algorithms, all right, uh, most especially on that chemical treatment uh, uh, decision blue program I talked about, it took, the experiences of the operators, and it took their input to ultimately help in programming these programs that we have in place to get the recommendations that are there. Um, you, you have to have support from the boots on the ground. Um, when you don't have the support of the staff, um, it, it just will it'll destroy you. I was fortunate to come in, and I just didn't walk in and become the manager of Akron Water. I worked as a plant engineer for a number of years, and I was was working alongside them in a lot of situations. And and you know the 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 folks that work night shift, the folks that work a, uh, afternoon shift, um, the folks that have to deal with all of the different emergencies that come up, and the amount of pressure that you're under, and working these crazy shifts, and the family life, and everything else. I really came to appreciate the the work that they did and so 
Um, I think that having that relationship and trusting in those those staff members that that you rely on so deeply, so deep in order for us to sleep at night, anyone who's responsible for drinking water supplies facility is relying on a lot of people after hours. I mean, we're a 24 seven organization. So you have to have the buy in and um, and really emphasize to them the fact that these tools are here to help you. These tools are not here to eliminate your job. Uh, these tools are here to ultimately help us produce a better product than we ever had before at the cheap, cheapest cost we can do it at. And, and you've been at this for a while. So what have been some of the reactions maybe initially and over time by staff members, leadership, customers, folks like that? How, how have they been embracing all of this innovation? Uh, positively, positively. I mean, um, most especially in that with, with all of the, the data we now have at our fingertips, um, it, it truly gives us opportunities to tell our stories in ways that we've never told before. So, you know, like, for example, and it was another example I didn't even bring up, but the generation of our monthly operating report. Okay, that monthly operating report took two to three hours a day from a single staff member to go through and find different data at different points and um, ultimately do that day's work for the monthly operating report. Now it takes one day, maybe two towards the end of the month um, where they simply have to run a few routines, double check some data. Um, and not have to go out and you know try to find data or notice data is missing or you know some some data that may be out of the range and we're surprised that at the end of the month. But I bring that up because we have so much data now. We can tell we can have you know uh, annual reports that that clearly describe how things uh, went on throughout the entire month. We can compare a lot of different things like our chemical costs and our chemical usage this year versus last year versus the previous year. We can continue to optimize and set goals and set, you know, um, you know, the, the measurable goals to, to say, we want to reach this in our, um, with respect to our turbidities for 2021. We want to, you know, meet these targets with regards to so costs of chemicals. Um, we want to try to have the best um, you know, lead and copper results that we possibly can have or beat last year's lead and copper results. And we can see it on a screen and present it and clearly show um, things that previously was not that easy to find. Um, and so those are the things we can tell a lot of good stories to, um, you know, good stories about our operations to uh, the administration, to our council, uh, to staff, uh, so it really does open up a lot of a lot of opportunity uh, with regards to just communicating our message and the importance and the value and, and the success that we're having here at Akron Water. So I've got one last question for you, my friend, before I turn you over to the uh, to the crowd. What advice do you have? for system operators and leaders who are looking to do similar projects or programs like you have? What what are the things that can get them started sooner? How do you accelerate those? And then I'll uh, turn you over to Billy. I think we've got a lot of questions from uh, from the group. Yeah, um, I'll tell you, the uh, first and foremost, you need to be a utility that internally has people you can rely on to be your technology expert or your technology manager. Here at Akron, um, Akron Water Plant, Jeff Van Atten, he's our team leader for technology. Um, I rely on him each and every day. And, um, you know, and, and we've, we've also created some job descriptions as well that support these initiatives such as we have a job description for automation and control technology. Uh, we have a job description for process controller. We have a job description for asset management technician. Um, all these jobs are 
clearly identifying to this staff member or the person that we bring in and hire in that you are going to be involved in SCADA. You are going to be involved in all of the IT infrastructure associated with our organization. It can't be just, say, for example, a mechanic that happens to tinker in some of these things. It has to be people that are specifically assigned to do this work. Secondarily, you need partners. You need support. The internal folks are great folks that I have, but they don't, in some cases, have some of the certifications um, like Gray Matter has. They don't have some of the certifications that we have a tremendous relationship with AECOM, with EDG, um, with Fontis Blue, like I mentioned earlier. You have to have these types of relationships to really help support a lot of these things that you're doing because the, 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 you know, the ideas and a lot of these tags and a lot of the uniqueness that you see here, it, it's, it, it starts with the internal staff, but then a lot of the delivery of the product is, you know, is from folks like Gray Matter that uh, can make these, you know, you know, these dreams come true, quite frankly. I mean, a lot of these things that we just love to implement, uh, it's just a team effort. So, Having the internal folks dedicated to this and then the outside support is very, very critical to make this a success. Uh, just again, appreciate it. Uh, Billy, have you got some questions from the group? Yes, and um, thank you uh, for your presentation on how Akron Water built one KPI to rule them all, um, Alan and Jeff. We do have several questions, so we'll just go ahead and dive into it. Uh, first question is from Angela. Angela would like to know, can you enter the data on a mobile device which uploads to the main program? No, we've, we've not um, gotten to that point where we have the data in, uh, entry screens mobile. A lot of that, and, and I didn't talk much about that, but the security of these systems is of the utmost importance. And so there's always been a little bit of fear of, of having devices and those devices being able to access the SCADA system. And so we're, we're tiptoeing around that, trying to find ways to where we can, you know, outside of these terminals and, and like what you're looking at here is a thin client VPN access where I don't have the ability to do anything but view, all right? Because the fear is if, if, um, if I were at one of the main terminals, now all of a sudden you have some control and you could cause some really catastrophic situations. So we're, we're looking at that. We're trying to find safe and secure ways of having devices that could feed into the SCADA system, but we're not yet at that point. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, our next question is from Christopher. Uh, Christopher would like to know, we all know with increased technology involvement comes more upkeep for analyzers and sensors, et cetera. I find as we improve, we don't allocate resources and teaching for these improvements. Do you receive the same support for maintenance and learning of these systems? Um, well, we've, so, We've we've gotten a lot of the support on at least the the instruments in the field, other than the analyzers. We put a lot of the responsibility of the calibrations and maintenance of the analyzers on the lab itself, because a lot of that is regulatory compliance related. And any of the analyzer information that's being used for regulatory compliance, um, in many cases, has to be done by a certified analyst. So. Um, that is, we have specific lab analysts on our staff that do that. Now, on all of the other sensoring and metering equipment, we've been relying on outside vendors to provide that support to us, um, but we're actually working on a job description right now um, called Instrument Technician that we're creating, where we're going to start doing a lot of the calibrations, the cleanings, um, a lot of this equipment in house. So we're doing our best to try to bring these things in house. But I'll tell you, it's, it's really difficult. 
Um, that instrument tech job that I just mentioned, we, we actually are rewriting it. It was out on the street for advertisement uh, several years ago when we attempted to bring in our own. And we just can't pay enough um, relative to where our salary ranges are um, to, to bring someone in house to do it under civil service rules as part of, you know, being part of our organization. So we've had to rely on that. So we're changing the job description. Um, we're looking at different pay rates for it. We're looking at different certifications and we're hoping to get that done in internally. And at that point, then we will take a whole lot of responsibility with regards to the training, with regards to all of the, the required routines and process associated with the calibrations on this. Okay, excellent. Thank you so much. Um, the next question is from Benoit. Benoit would like to know, is everything computerized, uh, meaning there are no paper documents? Uh, virtually all computerized. Um, in some cases, there are some laboratory rules that in Ohio, at least, that require a lab analyst to, to literally write down the number and initial that number. Okay, in those cases, we were not allowed by regulation to eliminate the paper. Um, but for, for virtually everything else, um, we are paperless. So um, that was one of the, the ultimate goals because when you go paperless, you now are putting data in a format that could be utilized by all these other different programs. Anything on paper, can, it, it's, it's, it cannot be shared. But anything that's put in a digital format that you saw, um, that can be compared and contrasted and documented and put in reports and a host of all these different opportunities. Excellent. And we have a lot of questions. Just to let the audience know, if we can't get to your question today, we will definitely have those answered after. Um, we have our next question is from Greg. Greg asks, could you explain how the chemical optimization piece works in a little more detail? Thank you. Uh, yeah, if you kill my uh, screen share real quick, I want to go back. I can't get back to my, I get a, okay, stop. Is that, is my screen share off actually, Alan? Yeah, you're not sharing no. the screen. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, so, yeah, what what ultimately, um, it, it, it's essentially a, a virtual jar test, I guess, is the best way to describe it, okay? It's, um, so this virtual jar test, um, is done instead of actual jar test, which a lot of folks know is a very cumbersome process. Um, it, it compares water treatment results for all different chemical doses. So it's actually looking at the raw water characteristics, some of the treatment characteristics that the lab has at this immediate time. Okay. And it takes that information. It says under these conditions, all right, these are the best recommended doses that um, the program describes to us, okay? And it gives that recommended dose based on historical information. So the program is actually saying, hey, we've, we've been through this once before. We have the data from three years ago that shows this very similar treatment technique. We have, you know, the, the dissolved organic carbon. Um, we have the chlorine demand. We have the raw and settled water turbidities. We have a fluorescence profile. We have all the, the UV um, information. We have all this information from a previous time that says that the best uh, combination of chemicals, and that those combination of chemicals include carbon, include permanganate, include chlorine dioxide, include alum, include um, sodium hypochlorite. All right, this is the recommended dose. And we actually are provided with three recommendations. One is the best quality water if money's no object. Excellent water, water, water quality, um, well beyond the standard, and then water quality to just meet the standard. And you can imagine in our world how dangerous that conversation can be at times um, because 
Um, you know, it's some people think that, hey, money should be no object. You should create the best water quality that you can. Well, there's really a balance point, And that's what we're trying to accomplish from this. So this ultimately um, will give us, you know, a, a recommendation to prov provide what would be a excellent water quality um, for an excellent cost. So it's the integration with iFix and a lot of those data entry screens that are able to make that happen. Okay, great. Well, we're going to move on to the next one because we have lots of questions. Um, Liliana has a question for you, Jeff. Um, what training was provided to staff so they could prepare for some of the new roles created to support the effort? A lot of training, a lot of training, a lot of training. Um, it, it it was kind of, and, and I'm I'm going back now a number of years. Okay, um, but it was like I, I remember preparing for stage two DBP, and that was impl implemented in 2012. And um, if, if many of you recall, that was a system-wide running annual average, all right, for disinfection by byproducts, THMs and HAAs. And generally speaking, in Akron, we were taking 12 sites, we're averaging it together, and it, it was easy. It was an easy number to meet. Well, then the stage two rules come about and they say, no, we're going to locational location running annual averages. And that changed everything now. So you no longer could take, you know, the really good sites over here and balance them out with the really bad sites over here. So we went through an extensive training program to say, here's what you need to do. Here's what we need to do operation staff in order to ensure that we are not going to violate some of these rules. And so it, it's a lot of different SOPs that have been put in place. I can't tell you the number of SOPs. Um, it, it's a host of different policies and procedures and how the staff reacts. Um, you know, things like the lead and copper and the utmost importance of getting our pH adjustment done right with caustic soda um, and our zinc orthophosphate feed. You know, so really talking through this with the staff saying this cannot be missed. And then now the public relations aspect of it you know it's it there's so much um publicity now with social media and communication and everything else when a utility screws up everybody knows about it 20 years ago when there wasn't social media and you were able to bury it in a monthly operating report where you know or a, a, a annual uh, ccr report um you know that those days are long gone it, it's all about transparency. It's all about notification. So, you know, communicating with staff that these procedures exist because failure cannot be an option. Failure is not an option. So. Okay, great. Well, I think we're going to go ahead and we'll ask one last question. This question is from Scott. Jeff, Scott would like to know, do you have distribution systems components like tanks and pump stations incorporated or is this plant only? Uh, we do. Um, if you can give me a screen share real quick. Uh, actually, no, I can't. I shut that down. I'm sorry. But yes, we, we do. I, I only talked about um, the water plant, but we have SCADA out in the um, distribution system and in the watershed as well. So we're going, um, and, and you know maybe in a year from now or two years from now, I'd love to give a presentation with regards to what we're doing in distribution because we're going through a, a meters project right now where we're changing, going all the smart meters. We're going to have remote disconnect meters so we don't have to shut it off at the curb. We shut it off the meter. We're going to have pressure sensors. We're going to have temperature. We're going to have backflow on all these meters. That's all going to be integrated into our SCADA. Right now, we have tanks, tank elevations. We have pump stations. Um, we, we have, um, you know, flow meters in certain areas. Um, we have a, a tremendous GIS system that I mentioned. So we're really going to work to try to integrate the SCADA with the GIS. Um, unaccounted for water, we have like hopes and dreams with unaccounted for water to really cut that down to where we're creating these DMAs, these designated metering areas, and being able to compare what's pumped in the area versus what we actually register through customers' meters. Um, 
Um, we're going to, we, we just, the, the sky's the limit, but yes, there, there, it does exist in distribution. It's good. It's going to be great in a couple of years from now. So. Well, excellent. Thank you again, Alan and Jeff, for spending this hour with us to discuss um, between Gray Matter and the City of Akron Water Supply Bureau, how you co-innovated to develop a customized operations hub. We very much appreciate it. Um, just that does conclude our webinar on how Akron Water built one KPI to rule them all. Before we go, I want to thank you for joining the webinar today. Don't forget to participate in the survey immediately following the webinar and follow the instructions to get your CEU credits. Thanks again, everybody.